Please stand for the Gospel of our Lord. Our Gospel this evening is taken from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 13, verses 6 through 9. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he went to look for fruit on it, but did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, For three years now I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? Sir, the man replied, leave alone for one more year, and I'll dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. So far, our text. Please be seated. Dear fellow trees in the vineyard of our Lord, the heading under Luke 13, when you look at your NIV Bible, is repent or perish. Kind of gives you a little summary of what the sermon's going to be like. Um, Maybe you don't think of yourself as a tree or a fruit, and yet this morning, (laughs) this evening, I'm going to ask you to think of yourself as a tree bearing a whole lot of fruit. That's what you do, Christian. And to hear God's words as a word of warning, and also hear these words as encouragement, because God does come and look for fruit in your life. When you enter into 2013, sometimes we think about you know, resolutions, what maybe we can do. But God is expecting more than just your activities in life and your goals. Those are great. Do those. But consider all that you have. Don't think about your bank account so much. Yes, your wallet is important to God, but so also is your calendar and your clock. How do you schedule your time? What do you do with yourself? What do you do with your children and your family? What impact do you have on your workplace, on the other kids in your class. They all watch you, and they all see the fruit that you bear for better or for worse. And so, I ask you to consider what you're going to do about that in 2013. This may sound like a tall order, and is God being fair to expect fruit from you? And yet, I would say, do you do any less? How long would you keep that tomato plant in your garden that would not produce big, red, ripe fruit? Would you look at a TV that didn't have any sound? How long would you do that? Would you keep on putting food into a refrigerator that didn't get cold? A car that wouldn't run, that looks really good in your driveway. I don't think we'd probably keep those, would we? God is not some mean, evil ogre Asking these things of you, I think it's legitimate for him to look upon his children and say, I bought you, body and soul. I have every right to expect fruit from you. Indeed, bear much fruit. Now, some people have a hard time with this again. Let me take you back to verse 7 and 6. I need to read that one first. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he went to look for fruit on it, but did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, For three years now I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree, and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? You can hear those verses, and you can hear what I just said about your life, and how God is expecting fruit from you. And you might think, well, maybe I have not been producing fruit. So that's why something horrible happened in my life. Maybe you look at the news and you wonder about people. Don't go to Connecticut, that's too easy. Yesterday, did you hear what happened in Oregon? A charter bus went off the road. Forty people were in it. Nine of them died. More than two dozen were injured. Which one of them deserved what they got? Had it coming. Did God start early? Was he sharpening his axe and just kind of taking a couple practice swings? And finally went, wham, you're done. Do you think that's how God treats you? Do you think God would demand your life of you because of your lack of fruit production? Or, 
I kind of already touched on this two Sundays ago, if you recall, after the tragedy with that Connecticut school, but I didn't go this direction. Do you think that maybe God likes you more? Maybe your life is so unbelievably fruit-filled, you just got a promotion. There's been an addition to your family. Things are going gangbusters. Your marriage is amazing. Your relationships are awesome. God must love you. Is that what we think? Is God so moody or fickle that He responds to your life uh, based on your behavior? We well, had the answer to that question just before our text. We're still in chapter 13 of the Gospel of Luke. But hear what happened. Pilate was going on a rampage. He was mad. And there were some Galileans who came down from up north in Jerusalem, up north in Israel, to Jerusalem to offer their sacrifices, and he slaughtered them all. And people asked him, which one of those sinned? Do you know what Jesus' response was? None of them. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. And Jesus brings up another example. He says, did you see the construction accident? Down at Siloam, where there was a tower that fell on 18 people. They all died. Do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. He is smashing the idea that there is supposed to be balance in the world. Some people call it karma. It's the Eastern lie that says that if you do something good, good will come back to you. It doesn't work that way. There are plenty of awful people in the world that have all kinds of good things roll their way constantly. If something bad happens to you, consider maybe God might be encouraging you. What does he say? He says, Sir, the man replied, leave it alone for one more year and I'll dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. Then cut it down. Could God be using some misfortune in your life to fertilize, to cultivate? Maybe. We do not know. But we have God's promise that He is not so fickle. But if there's something in your life, could you look at that bus accident in Oregon and think, man, that's awful. All those people died. I haven't called my mom lately. I haven't been pretty nasty to my spouse. If anything horrible causes you to give pause and repent, that's not bad. But do not think that you are deserving of any good or any bad. God does not treat us as our sins deserve. What God's trying to do is to take our focus off all the things that we have. And to put it back on the number one thing in your life. The most important goal for 2013 for you needs to be that you would strengthen your relationship with Him. He speaks to this in the Gospel of Matthew. This is Matthew chapter 10. He says, Do not be afraid of the one who can kill the body, but not the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Of all the things that you need to worry about, it's not the fiscal cliff. It's how does God see me? What is my relationship like with Him? Am I right? I've told you on more than one occasion, I get so much mileage out of the question, how are you and God doing? Are you doing great? And so often people don't know how to answer that because they base that answer on their fruit and on their reaction. They think that God might like them if things are going well. God doesn't like me. I just had the flu. We just talked about that. That's not how it works. You know that God loves you because Jesus died for your sins. The gardener who's defending this tree, he's the one that loves you. Do you see that pic? Did anyone tell me what that green thing is next to those boxes? 36 million of those will fill the curbs of America over the next month. Those are Christmas trees. Christmas trees that people spent hours decorating. And then in just a few weeks, to the curb. 
God does not do that with you. He died that you might be His forever. That you be in His family. Your eternity is locked up. He's preparing a place with your name on it just for you. Why would He leave you to the wolves in 2013? He won't. He'll see you through any financial tax, whatever. It doesn't matter. He'll see you through all kinds of economic hardship. That's His promise. He'll see you through all physical problems. What's the worst thing that can happen? Might God demand your life of you in this next year? Maybe. But you'll be with Him forever. And all of those around you whom you love will see you one day. You have nothing to fear. Rather, take advantage of the opportunities you have in His Word, in the Lord's Supper this evening, to strengthen your relationship with your God. Because, my fellow trees, He does come looking for fruit. And He has every right to expect it. And He gives us so many ways to encourage it. Amen. Please stand.